Well, hello. Welcome to our first official gathering of 2022. Again, my name is Josh. If we haven't met before or if you've forgotten, that's fine. Um, and <laughs> please don't shout your name all at once because that would be very confusing and hard to follow. Um, it's great to get to share with all of you who are in the service today and for everyone who's joining us online as well. Um, yeah, it's a privilege to get to bring the first message of this year and hopefully it's helpful and uh, useful to you in your day-to-day living. We're starting a new series this uh, month called New Year, Same Me, because it is a new year, but unfortunately, we've brought ourselves into it, (laughs) which is good and bad depending on how you rate yourself. So I'm excited what we're going to be looking at for this series, because we're actually going to be camping out around the idea of wisdom, which I think we all need a little bit more of as time goes on, and we get to gain, thank goodness, as time goes on as well. I'm excited about this series particularly because wisdom is something which underpins our choices and our choices impact uh, the way we use our money, the way we engage in our relationships, uh, our our spirituality, how we use our time, our energy, our attention. The choices that you and I make are impacted by the wisdom that we follow. So we're going to have a look under the hood at wisdom and how we use it. And I think it's going to be a great start to the year because as the world changes around us and as our world changes within us, we all need a little bit more wisdom as time goes on. So the big question behind this series is this. What do you do when you follow you everywhere? What do you do when you follow you everywhere? Because here's one thing I can say with certainty about your life is that any past decision you've made, bad mistake, wise investment, successful relationship, unsuccessful relationship, any conflict, any financial decisions, any decision you've made in the past, you were right there when you made it. And some of them were good. Some of them could go either way. Some of them not so good. We try and forget those ones and then stay awake at night thinking about them. So over this series, we're going to be going through four Proverbs. And we're going to be looking at the life of Jesus to see how we can apply wisdom to our year. So here's our flight plan for the next four weeks. This week, we're going to be looking at the idea that we need to get wisdom. We need to go and get wisdom. How do we do that? We're going to have an explore of that. We're going to look at Proverbs 4 and have a look at one of Jesus' famous interactions as recorded by Mark. Next week, we're going to go out for a stroll because we are all on a path and the path that we are on matters, that we walk matters because it leads us to a destination. So we're going to look at Proverbs 4 and how wisdom guided Jesus through one of his toughest moments as recorded by Matthew. Then the third week, which is I'm looking forward to the most, is thou shall not. The third week, we're going to look at a proverb in which it outlines what God does not like. And there's a common theme through that part of the proverb, which is basically God cares how we treat other people. So we're going to have a look at what Jesus says as to how we should treat others and learn a little bit about what God wants us to do when it comes to treating other people well. And then finally, we're going to look at two ways to live. We're going to take our last week to consider how we should live going forward. Because there's two ways we can live, as some of the Proverbs say. We can live wisely or we can live foolishly. So we're going to land out there, Proverbs chapter 3, and a story that Jesus tells through the book of Luke. So at the end of this series, if you've been here every week, hopefully you'll see that it's important to get wisdom, discern the path well, love others well, and choose to live wisely. And hopefully that should answer the question, what do you do when you follow you everywhere? Get wisdom. Discern your path. Love other people. Choose to live wisely. And hovering above that, as always, is to put our trust in Jesus and trust that he will be with us and guide us through the power of his Holy Spirit as we live wisely to glorify God and for the good of others. So let's get into it. Who made a resolution this year? Don't be shy. Hands up. Who made some New Year's resolutions? Anybody? Yeah? Yeah, a couple. Just literally a couple in here. Uh, Put it in the chat if you want to tell us if you made a New Year's resolution. Um, Who actively chose not to? Yeah, who actively chose not to? It wasn't just a passing thought. Like, it it didn't go above your radar. You went, I know about it, and I'm actively choosing to not make a resolution this year. Yeah. Who forgot or who does not care? That's the majority, isn't it? That is the majority. Here's where I land. 
I know for a fact, I know that stopping, taking stock of where I am and where I want to be is important. I know that. We should take moments to stop, look where we are and where we want to be. I know that that's important. I know that stopping and taking time to assess the gap between where I am and where I want to be is a wise exercise to do. It's how we achieve things. It's how we grow. It's how we learn. But what I have experienced as time has gone on, especially through my late teens and early 20s, the pain of setting big goals and failing. You get to the beginning of the year, you're going to lose this weight, you're going to read this many books, you're going to run this many miles, you're going to form this many new friendships, and you put up all these things and you hope and dream, and then it doesn't happen. And it hurts to set those big goals and to fail again and again. So when I hear about New New Year's resolutions and making changes at this time of season, which is a season to make change, I know it's a wise exercise. I know it's a wise exercise but I feel I'm going to fail because of my past experiences. What about you? Is that sort of where you land? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you've had smashing successes with them. Awesome. Write a book. There's a few out there about, about it. We can write a book. But making changes just in general is hard. Can I get agreement on that? It's difficult. It's hard to make changes. At the beginning of the year, in the middle of the year, at the end of the year, at any time in our year, whenever we want to actively make a change in our life, it's just plain difficult. Whether we want to start a new habit, whether we want to stop a bad habit, whether we want to change our routine or our rhythm, it's hard. And the reason it's hard is because what you currently do makes sense to you. The life that you've carved out for yourself, the things you choose to participate in, you do that because it makes sense. Your family of origin, your history, your past experiences, it makes sense to act the way you act. And it's only when we have those stop and assess moments that we go, hmm, I need to change something. The stop and assess moments happen in our life when we're living our lives and we notice something. And we stop, we look at where we are, and we go, I'm not happy with this. For some of us, it's when we look in a mirror. We're walking along, enjoying our lives happily, and we look in the mirror and go, hmm. For some of us, it's our bank accounts. Maybe you've been using your card a little bit too much over Christmas and you stop, you go into Westpac, you do your face ID and you go, hmm. For some of us, your friend bought a new something, a new house, maybe they bought a new boat, maybe they bought a new car and you foolishly go around to go look at it and then you go home and you go, huh, (laughs) theirs is better, (laughs) theirs is newer, theirs is shinier. Maybe you're in a context where you see somebody handle stress or Um, handle conflict and they handle it really well and you go I don't do that when I'm under stress or when I embrace conflict maybe I need to be a little bit more like that or maybe for you you say something and in the back of your head the thought drops in I sound just like mum I sound just like dad and I hated it when mum or dad did that these stop and something's got to change moments happen in our lives But to change, to stop and go, I need to change something, and then to actively change it is just plain difficult. And the research is in. We revert to first learned behaviours when the changes we cause make stress or we fail to meet the new standards that we set for ourselves. We want to change. We want to be better. We want to start that new habit. We want to stop that old routine that doesn't help us get where we want to go. But research says that once the stress comes on and once it gets difficult, you're going to go back to what you know. And it's hard to change those keystone habits. So let's put psychology, social norms, sociology, and about a million self-help books to the side and go, is there any wisdom we can learn from God when it comes to making change? I believe that there is. So the book of Proverbs, this is where we're going to camp out for the next four weeks. Next week, we'll go and have a look a little bit more around the book of Proverbs itself and learn a bit about it. But for now, all you need to know is that there is a book in the Old Testament called Proverbs, which contains Proverbs. Yep. Simple one, isn't it? Slam dunk. The answer is not Jesus. It's within the question. Anyway, it's really simple. Proverbs are in there and it records Proverbs. Proverbs are general wisdom, sometimes they're riddles, taunt songs. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, Perplexing questions and object lessons generally from the perspective of a person who is suffering. Now, Proverbs are not something. They are not this. They're not silver bullets and they're not always right. We understand this when it comes to 
out of Bible literature, like Proverbs are general wisdom. They are generally true, but we can always think of an example where it wasn't true. But for some reason, sometimes we go to the book of Proverbs and we take them as moral absolutes or truth, whereas that's not the case. Uh, R.C. Sproul, a late theologian, said, even divinely inspired Proverbs do not necessarily apply to all life's situations. Rather, they reflect insights that are generally true. So when you go to the book of Proverbs, and if you haven't read it before, it's great. There's so much wisdom in there. And if you could just do what it says there, you will live a life which is more giving, caring, kind, and for people and for God. It's there. But it's not always true. It's not always. So we're going to learn some stuff as general, general wisdom. So as I said before, we're going to look next week at what Proverbs is as a book. But for now, let's get into an actual proverb and learn about this idea of getting wisdom. You can follow along on the screen uh, or you can go to your Bible. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. And this is what it says. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. For I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me and he said to me, Take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Sounds like a threat, doesn't it? Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Cherish her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will give you a garland of grace on your head and present you with a glorious crown. So the language is great, isn't it? Get wisdom. You want to be wise? Get wisdom. Very helpful to say, how? How do we get wisdom? We're going to have a look at that uh, now. How do we get wisdom? It's out there. How do we go and get it? Here's a few ways that we gain wisdom in our lives. And when we use the word wisdom here, it's not just about being able to sit back and go, hmm, I know what is right. That's not wisdom. Wisdom is applying it to your life so that you live right. So you live in a way which is for the glory of God and for the good of the people that you've been placed in community with. So how do we gain wisdom in our day-to-day living? We can learn from our past experiences. You have done some really great stuff and you've done some really not great stuff. Wisdom is to go back through those moments and go, what can I learn about what I have lived? We can learn from the experiences of others. So much more rewarding than your own experiences, especially on the bad side. Because it's so great to be able to learn from other people's stories, the pain they've been through, the mistakes, the silliness they've gone through, rather than have to go and endure it myself. I can't fly a helicopter to save my life, but I know with wisdom that it should be in the air and not upside down on the ground. I don't have to go through a crash to experience that piece of wisdom. I can look around in my life and go, it's really kind when we talk well to other people in a way which loves them. I haven't said many hateful words to people, but I've observed when hateful words have been said that it creates conflict and unease and it hurts people. So we can learn from the experience of other people. It's great and it's free because it's everywhere. Just go to the news. You'll learn a lot of experience from people who make some interesting choices. We can gain wisdom from contemplation, reflection and silence. (laughs) It's God. Um, anyway. uh, contemplation, reflection, and silence. Taking time to just be. Observe nature. Reflect on your thoughts. Contemplate pieces of scripture or other wise things that we read. And silence, just being silent and allowing God to speak to us. And we can also gain wisdom by reading, watching, and listening well. well. Now, the proverb tells us there's actually a reward when we get wisdom. It says that we will live. It says that wisdom will watch over us. It says that wisdom will honor us. Wisdom is worth getting. And we know our lives are better when we have good wisdom, which leads to good choices, which leads to great outcomes in our lives. Now, I want to have a look. If you've got your Bible, we're going to flick over to Mark 12, 28 to 34. Because there's a moment in Jesus' life where I believe we have an insight into the result of Jesus having gained wisdom as he lived his earthly 
life. Now, yes, he's God, and we'll get to that in just a second, but he still had to grow up. He still had to learn. He still had to gain wisdom. Here's an interaction where Jesus, after 30 years of living, has gained a bunch of wisdom, and he's asked a tough question, and he has a great answer to be able to give. This is what it says. It's on the screen. Otherwise, follow along in your Bible. It says, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. They're having a debate. Noticing that Jesus was giving good answers, he asked him. So this guy rocks up, sees this great debate going on, goes, Jesus is really clued on here. I think I've got one. Of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now, this is a really big question because the commandments are what gave the Jewish people their structure for living. So for them to go up, him to come up and say, what's the greatest commandment? He's saying, how shall we live best? And Jesus answers after I'd imagine a bit of a pause because it's a big question. It deserves a bit of waiting for anticipation. Yeah. The most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and mind. Uh, with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The guy asks for one, he gets two. It's a bargain. Well said, teacher, the man replies. You are right in saying God is one and there is no one but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and all your strength and all your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. So he's saying it doesn't matter what you do in terms of burnt offering and sacrifice. It doesn't matter how many times you say you're sorry or how the act looks. He's saying at the end of the day, loving God and loving others reign supreme in what we do. When Jesus saw the guy had answered wisely, he said, hmm, you're not far from the kingdom of God, which is a big compliment. Jesus was all about the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared to ask Jesus any more questions. That'd be great, wouldn't it? You're in a debate. The tension is high, you get a question, you smash it out of the park, and everyone's like, nah, not touching that one. Like, Jesus didn't have pride, but that'd be a pretty, like, you know, that'd be pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Now, how do you think Jesus was able to give such an insightful and a great, helpful answer? Now, yes, he was the Son of God. Yes, he was at the beginning of creation, putting everything together. We see that through the other parts of the New Testament. However, he gave up a lot when he stepped into the story of humanity and became a human. Because while Jesus was fully God, he was also fully human. Here's a couple of things that he exchanged when he entered into our story. He exchanged omnipresence for unipresence. Before coming and being part of the human experience, he, had, he was part of God's omnipresence. He could see everything. But I don't know if you've noticed, as humans, we can see one thing. I'm here. Now, mentally, you guys might be somewhere else. That's on you. But <laughs> you're here physically, but are you here? Yeah, anyway. But we can only ever be in one place. Our feet can only take us to here. Our mind, I mean, these days with the internet go anywhere, but you can only be in one side at a time. You can only be in one conversation meaningfully at a time. When Jesus came onto earth, he had to embrace unipresence. He had to be with who he was with. He couldn't see and be everywhere and be everything is one of the most important marks of his ministry for us is because if he is the example for us to follow if he was able to do everything and go everywhere and be everything to everyone it'd be a very hard thing to follow but Jesus could only heal one person at a time he could only be present with one person at a time and there were times he had to say no no to his family because he was at work other times he had to say no to his work because he was with his family great example for us to follow he gave up his omnipresence for unipresence he had to give up knowing everything to have to learn everything. Remember, he came in as a child, a baby. I don't think there was a lot going on up here when he was a baby. Basic instincts, cry, poop, drink, cry. I mean, he's a child. You don't like to think about, like, it's interesting to me because I just find it amazing. Like, God chose to give up his glory, amazingness, his power, and he became a child who had to have his butt wiped. I mean, that's amazing. Talk about humility. Talk about humbling. That's incredible to me. I just can't get over that. And he gave up immediate power for relying on God's timing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is recorded in another place as saying, I can do nothing by myself, only what I see my Father doing. 
I think this is quite literal. He has to rely on God the Father for everything because of his humanity. And I say up here, he doesn't get, I say this, sorry, he doesn't get access to God mode as he did before. Satan takes him up, another piece of scripture, the devil takes him up and says, you can do anything you want. And he says, I'm going to embrace the humanity that I have to have. I'm not here to just come up and do things the way that Satan was trying to get him to make food, be great, do these things. And he's like, that's not my agenda. I'm following what the Father has put before me. And I'm going to do it in a way so that this movement goes beyond me. I think it's incredibly wise and powerful what Jesus did here. So here, in this story of this person coming and asking him a question, I think this is an example of what can happen when we gain wisdom, when we learn what the proverb says, that wisdom is worth attaining, worth basing our lives upon. Because when we gain wisdom, we become helpful to those around us. Jesus, in this moment of answering this question, was incredibly helpful to those around him. Because they're debating and talking about it, and they're trying to figure out what, who is God, what does he want from us, and all this sort of stuff. And Jesus gave a really helpful answer. You want to summarize everything that has come before us? Here it is. Love God, love other people. So when we allow wisdom to become our friend then we're able to see what needs to change in us. And the outcome of that, I believe, is that we become less concerned with what needs to change in other people. Wisdom is hard to see in the mirror, but it is so easy to see in other people. Right now, if we wanted to, uh, I could come around and one by one we could go through your life, what you spend your time on, what you spend your money on, how you make decisions, how do you treat your friends and family, how have you invested in yourself, how do you spend time with Jesus? We could go around one by one and I could hear what you have to say in those areas and I can guarantee you this, I'll have some, I'll have some solutions or answers for you. I'll have some advice to give you. Because when we give our example of who we are to other people, they don't see it the way we see it. They don't have the emotional ties, the past history that we have. When someone comes up and says, ah, I'm having money problems, you could rock up and say, stop spending money on this, this, this and this and they'll go, hmm. I like my lifestyle. If someone's having a problem with their family member, you can go up to them and say, well, have you tried this, this, and this? And they'll be like, hmm, tried that once and it hurt. Someone could be having an issue at work and you can give some friendly advice to them, but it's more difficult because as we live what we live, we have created the rhythms, routines that we have for a reason. They're tied to us in a way which just doesn't require quick, easy solve. Even though a lot of the time... If we're honest, our problems are not complicated. They're just hard for us to actually do something with. I'm not attached to your circumstances the way you are. The habits you form, the emotions you've spent, your past scars, your past successes, the rhythms you have today. For good or the bad, the choices you've made with the wisdom you've had is the result. The result is you. You are where you are because of past decisions. That's why wisdom is so important. It helps inform our decision making. You in the current moment is you because of what past you did, which is helpful or unhelpful, depending where you are right now. So like the proverb says, go and get wisdom. Like we see in the life of Jesus, when you have wisdom and apply it to a situation, we can be really helpful. And like Bluey from the video, sometimes you just need to get back on the bike. Try again. Give it another shot. I love what Bluey did. Here we go. Let's theologize from a a children's show. She was struggling. She stopped. She watched. She learnt. She got some, let's do this. She got back on, did it. Isn't that incredible? Yeah? I like Bluey. Bluey's awesome. So what do you do when you follow you everywhere? I think we we need to become people who seek to make wiser choices the next time around. Here is a question which I've used many times and will continue to use through my whole life because I find it helpful. When I say get wisdom, great, Josh, how do I get wisdom? Here's one way which I think wisdom can be attained. There is a question which if we stop, ask it and ask it honestly and answer it honestly, helps give us a filter to make a wise choice. And you've heard me say it before if you've been with us for a while. If not, this I've stolen this from um, Andy Stanley in America. But the question is simply, what is the wise thing to do? What is the wise thing 
to do. Wisdom is hard to see in the mirror, but easy to see in others. So give yourself a gift, and it's a gift to be able to stop and ask, what is the wise thing for me to do here? And it's very important for you to ask, what is the wise thing for me to do? Because we all have different struggles, different hopes, different backgrounds, different dreams, different strengths. So what is wise for you may not be wise for me. And the reason this question is so great is because it gets beyond what is the right thing to do, what is the, um, you know, in this context, I should normally be doing this. But you stop and you go, well, what's the wise thing? What, what do I believe is the best thing for me with my resources, my background, my understanding of the circumstances? What is the wise thing for me to do here? For example, uh, you might be someone who struggles with alcohol. So going to a social drinking setting may not be a wise thing. It's not a wrong thing to do, but maybe a wise thing might be to not put yourself in that space. For me, because I don't like the taste of alcohol, it's fine to go to a social drinking setting because it makes me feel sick if I have it anyway. But for you, you might be fine walking down Cole's Dairy Isle with the chocolates. <laughs> it's why You can walk past those chocolates. They do not call your name. Me, however, I try and actively avoid the confectionery aisle because I know my self-control with chocolate is about this much. What's wise for you to do it may not be what's wise for me to do. So the question, what is the wise thing to do, contextualizes it for your particular situation and helps you think through what is it that I should be doing with the time that I have. Now, if you want to maximize this practice and take it to the next level, it's one thing to ask yourself, Josh, what is the wise thing to do? Thank you, Josh, for that advice. I'm going to ignore it this time, and then you go and make a mistake. You want to maximize it? I dare you to ask someone else. Go to someone else and say, hey, friendo, hey, mate, hey, buddy, hey, spouse, hey, child, hey, grandparent, hey, parent. This is what I've got going on at the moment. I don't want you to tell me what you would do, because people are really happy to do that. I'm struggling with this. Well, when I went through that back then in the day, I did this. And you're like, thank you, not quite the same situation. Parenting, get it all the time. You ask someone some advice on parenting and everyone has a million answers to everything ever. Anyway, um, go to them and say, what, what do you think is the wise thing for me to do? And allow them to answer and think about it, reflect on it, plan, act. Maybe you need to take it to God. Take it to Jesus. Say, God, I'm struggling with this. This is an area of my life I need help in. Can you give me some wisdom? Can you put some people around me who are wise in this area? Can you teach me something so that I can grow in my following of you? Then listen, assess, reflect, plan and act. Get wisdom of all, at all costs. It will position us to be a blessing to those around us. And getting wisdom allows us to help make changes. You want change to be a part of your life? Start asking the question, what is the wise thing for me to do? I promise you will never run out of, why, out of answers to that question. Because situations change. Relationships change. Our life changes in complexity, in all sorts of ways. So if you go around and you want to change something in your life, ask that question and answer it honestly. But I also promise that your life will be so much richer and so much more rewarding if you take the advice and ask that question. 